And that leads us to doing dihybrid Punnett squares. Dihybrid Punnett squares are just a little bit different than monohybrid Punnett squares because we're looking at two traits at the same time. So let's look at a trait. Let's look at green seeds and yellow seeds. And then we're also going to look at the smooth or round seeds and the wrinkled seeds. Now yellow is dominant and round is dominant. And so for the parents, we're going to say that the male plant was heterozygous dominant for yellow and was also heterozygous dominant for round. And the female plant had the same genotype. So was heterozygous for the yellow trait and also heterozygous for the round trait. Now a lot of students get confused right here because they want to take these letters and they see that there's four in the genotype and they want to just place them above the four boxes and on the sides. But that's not what you have to do. The first thing you have to do is you have to figure out what the options are in the um, parent's genotype. So for example with the father um, we're going to figure out what options there are for these traits. And this is often referred to as uh, similar to the FOIL method in math. So what you do is you take the first Y with the first R and you put those letters above the first box. Then you take the first Y with the second R and you put those letters in the second box or above the second box. Then you take the second Y with the first R, put those letters above the box, and then take the second Y with the second R and put those letters above the last box. You're going to do the same thing with the mother's genotype. Now, the mother's genotype just happens to be the same as the father's genotype, so these letter combinations are going to be the same. But it doesn't always work out that way. So just depends on what your cross is, what the traits of the parents are. Um, sometimes you'll have to foil both the mothers and the fathers. Sometimes they'll be the same, and so you only have to do one, and then you'll know what to put above your boxes and beside your boxes. Now, when you go to fill in these boxes, instead of putting YR, YR, it will make it much more easier for you to read later if you put your Y's together and you put your R's together. So you'll notice here, this makes it really easy to see that this is homozygous dominant for the yellow seed and this is homozygous dominant for the round seed. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to fill in the rest of these boxes. Now we want now what we want to do, once we have the boxes filled in, we want to look at our phenotypes. And so what we're going to look at is how many of these offspring are yellow with round seeds, how many are yellow with wrinkled seeds. We'll look at how many are green with round seeds and how many are green with wrinkled seeds. And so in order to figure that out, we'll go through and for yellow round, we need to look for the ones that are either homozygous dominant for both traits or heterozygous dominant for both traits. So here's this first one fits that category, the second one fits that category, the third one fits that category. So what I have here is I have nine yellow round. And next I'm going to go through and I'm going to look for the yellow wrinkled. And this one I think I'll 
show you which ones I'm counting here. So I need to find the ones that are dominant for the yellow and are recessive for the round trait. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to look for the lowercase r's where there's uppercase um, y's. And so this one fits that, and this one fits that category. This one fits that category. So I have three that are yellow wrinkled. Now I'm going to go through and I'm going to find the ones that are green round. And so for green round, what I need to do is I need the, the Y's to be lowercase and the R's can, have to have at least one uppercase letter. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to look for lowercase Y's where there's uppercase R's. And I have three of those. And then I'm going to look for the green wrinkled. So what I'm looking for there is I want to find the ones that have lowercase y's and lowercase r's. And you'll see that there's only one of those. And this is a typical ratio that we find with a dihybrid Punnett square where we cross a heterozygous with a heterozygous. What you're going to come up with is a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So you're going to have nine that are both traits are dominant. You're going to have three where the first trait is dominant, the second trait is recessive. You're going to have three where the first trait is recessive and the second trait is dominant. And you're going to have one where both traits are recessive. All right, now we're going to talk about things that Mendel didn't know. So Mendel worked with traits where there was one option or the other. So there was only two possibilities. So the color of the flowers was either purple or white. And there was no variation of traits in between that. But we know that there are traits where there's a lot of variation. So for example, eye color. We know there are a lot of different variations of eye color. There's not just two traits. Um, there's not just three traits. If we were looking at blue, green, or brown, there's a lot of variation within those traits. And so Mendel didn't really address that where there was a lot of variation in the traits. And so like when he was looking at the pea plants, they were either tall or short. There was not a variation in between you know, plants that were maybe medium tall or medium short. Another thing that Mendel didn't talk about was he didn't look at where there was um, a co-dominance situation. And in this situation, there's more than um, two genotypes that you can look at. And blood type is a good example of this. In order to have blood type A, A is dominant. And so if you have um, two of the A alleles, you will have type A blood. O is recessive, so you could get type A blood. If you have an allele for A and allele for O, you're going to have type A blood because A is dominant to O. B is basically the same way. So with B, if you have two of the alleles for type B, you're going to have type B blood. If you have the allele for type B and the allele for type O, you're going to have type B because B is dominant to O. But one thing that's a little bit different about this is if you get the allele for type A and the allele for type B, you're going to have type AB blood. And so that's codominance because they're basically equal in dominance to each other and so you end up with a new phenotype. Another situation that Mendel didn't explain is when you have um, an incomplete dominance. And so this situation, what you have is you would have a parent plant that has red flowers and a parent plant that has white flowers and the offspring would give you pink flowers. And then when you cross those, you might get some red back, you might get white, and you might get some pink flowers. And so the way that this cross works is the only way that you can have the red 
is if it's dominant. And the only way you can have the white is if it is recessive. And then when you cross those, so we put the fathers on top, the mothers on the side, and we get the heterozygous condition in all four boxes. The heterozygous condition is pink. So you'll never see red or never see white if you have the heterozygous. You'll always see pink. So let's look and see what happens then if we cross the heterozygous with the heterozygous. So this is taking a pink flower plant and crossing it with another pink flower plant. Well, we get the homozygous dominant, we get a heterozygous, we get another heterozygous, and we get a recessive. And so what we see here is that this is going to be red, this is going to be pink, this will be pink, and this is going to be white. And so that is an example of incomplete dominance. Another thing that Mendel didn't address is called pleiotropy. Um, and in this situation, the um, one gene is actually controlling several different traits. And so Mendel didn't talk about that because Mendel's work was done before, you know, a lot of gene studies were done. Um, and so Mendel really couldn't speak to this part of it. He knew that some factor was causing dominance and recessive, but he didn't really know about genes yet. Another situation that Mendel didn't address is called sex-linked genes. And so these would be the um, genes that are on the X or the Y chromosomes. So just as a reminder, females are XX, they have two X chromosomes, and males are XY, so they have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And this leads to some special situations when it comes to genes that are on these chromosomes. So let's take hemophilia, for example. Hemophilia is a blood disorder, and it actually was very common among the royal families. And um, one of the reasons for that is because um, if the mother has the hemophilia, even if she is heterozygous, if she passes on that heterozygous or that recessive part of that heterozygous trait, then the son is automatically going to have hemophilia because it only shows up on the X chromosome. So let's, let's um, look at a cross. We have the father who is um, dominant for the hemophilia trait. That means that he does not have it. And there is no allele on the Y because this is not a trait that's carried on the Y chromosome. The mother is heterozygous. So she has the um, heterozygous alleles. That means that she's a carrier. So she does not suffer from that disorder. But because she has the recessive trait, she can pass it along. That makes her a carrier. So when we do a Punnett square cross between this father and this mother, then what we do is we put these on the Punnett square. We put the X chromosome, so we have the X here, and we show that that's the dominant for the hemophilia. So that's the father's X, and then we also put the father's Y there. For the mother, we put the first X that has the dominant for hemophilia, and we put the second X that has the recessive for hemophilia. Then when we do our cross here, when we put our letters into the box, we show those traits on those chromosomes. So here we have the dominant dominant. So this is not affected. And is this male or female? Well, it's an X and an X, so this would be a female offspring that's not affected. This is an XY, so this is going to be a male. This is the dominant case, so this male is not affected either.
Down here we have two X's, so we have another female. We have the dominant and the recessive, so this is a heterozygous female, and this would be a carrier. She's not affected by the disorder, but she can pass it on, so she is considered a carrier of that disorder. This is going to be a male, has a recessive for hemophilia, so he is affected by this disorder. And that's a common situation in disorders that are X-linked. The males are going to be affected by it much more often than the females. The females have to have both recessive um, alleles in order to have the disorder. The males only have to receive one recessive allele and then they will show that disorder because it doesn't show up on the Y. There's nothing that's going to cancel that out. There's no chance for a dominant trait to cancel out this recessive. If it gets passed along, it gets that recessive allele, then he is affected by that disorder. All right, so now we're going to talk about chromosome numbers. In, um, in organisms, the, chromosome, the total chromosomes in the somatic cells is diploid. And so there's basically two sets of chromosomes. In the gametes, it's haploid. So it would be one set of chromosomes. So in um, a human, we have 46 chromosomes in our somatic cells, and we have 23 chromosomes in our gametes. There are some chromosomal abnormalities that can happen, and so this is usually during the process of meiosis. And what can happen is, as meiosis goes through anaphase two, there could be too many chromosomes put into a gamete, and so you might end up with trisomy, where um, instead of having two chromosomes after fertilization, there's actually three chromosomes. Another error that could happen in meiosis is not enough um, chromosomes get put into the um, sperm or egg cell. And then when the egg is fertilized, you have a situation called monosomy, where there's only one of those chromosomes in instead of the normal complement of two chromosomes. Karyotypes are done to see if there's any chromosome abnormalities. So if you look at the karyotype that is on the left-hand side here, you'll see that it shows um, 22 chromosomes with matching pairs, but then there's the 23rd chromosome that shows the X and Y, which are called the sex chromosomes. And so looking at this karyotype, this would be a male. Now over here on the right hand side, this shows um, a karyotype with an abnormality. So here, um, chromosomes 21, there's actually three of them instead of the normal two. And so you can see that this is a female because there's two X chromosomes, but this karyotype shows that there's a problem here because chromosome 21 has three chromosomes instead of two. And that is the, um, th that is what leads to Down syndrome. So that's the end of the presentation. I hope that this has been helpful.